Well, it's certainly been a snowy winter with the mountains and most of the front range running well above its season to date snowfall averages, at least so far through the end of January. December and January have been especially snowy for the front range and the mountains, which is a little unusual. We'll get into this here in just a second with most of the state at or above 120% of its season to date snow packages. Good news. But for more about the how and why behind all this and what it might mean for the spring and perhaps even the summer and beyond, I'm now joined by fellow 90s meteorologist and my fellow nerd, meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen, for a bit more about this. Corey, sorry for calling you a nerd, but uh, I think you would agree with that, wouldn't you? I've been called worse, Chris, and uh, I think uh, I think I fit right in there. So, uh, yeah, happy to join you here, man, to discuss what seems like a real winter. It feels like a real winter to me, and perhaps this was all written in the stars before the season starts. I mean, the Farmer's Almanac tried to tell us that we'd be freezing our butts off in s- December and January, but um, that has been... The the snow has been awesome. Uh, it's been frequent in some spots, slightly above average in some spots, well above average. But the cold has been the highlight for me. Um, I think you can expect it to vary, uh, you know, as far as snow totals here and there. Um, but for such a big area to be uh, significantly colder, than expected. I think that's been the highlight of this winter uh, for me. As we record this on Tuesday, January the 24th, uh, Corey, we've been kind of running the numbers a little bit here. It looks like we're on pace to finish with our coldest January since in Denver, 2007. Uh, that's the way it's looking right now, right, Corey? Yeah, exactly. And uh, it, it may be, I mean, we still have another month to go in the winter, um, but one thing that's interesting, if you look at the coldest winter that Denver uh, has had in the last 30 years, it was the 2006-2007 season, which is the season that it wasn't huge uh, as far as snow totals, but it was huge for snow cover. And that was the year that we set all those amazing records for uh, snow being on the ground for an extended period of time. Uh, the entire month of January, there was more than two inches of snow uh, sitting on the ground, and that streak hit like more than 60 days for uh, one inch and more than 60 days for more than two inches. So that snow cover that's sitting on the ground has such a huge impact. It's almost like this uh, positive feedback loop for the rest of the winter. Interesting there. And again, to kind of back things up a little bit, you know, what we're talking about is the amount of snow on the ground. Of course, if you lived in Denver for a long time or along the front range for a long time, you know, it's not common to have snow sitting on the ground for as long as we've had it. And that's essentially the point here is that snow. uh, I'm from the East Coast originally. It's normal in the New York area where I grew up to get these big snowstorms and you get a nor'easter, you get a foot, foot and a half of snow. That thing's going to be on the ground for the next two months. In Denver, of course, normally we get That snow, next day or two days later, it's 50, 55 degrees, boom, it's gone. But would you say this winter and the cold behind it has been more unusual for the front range, Corey, or for the mountains? Well, I think the the cold has been more unusual for the front range. Like you said, uh, people from New York, Michigan, Minnesota, they're laughing at us. Because, you know, we've we've got our our uh, cuffs all set up because of this um, this long lasting snow on the ground that that is the most unusual thing for the winter. Now, when you look at the snow, the snow altogether, I mean, um, it's strange Uh, for for Denver. We've only had two storms the entire season. Uh, produce more than four inches of snow. Uh, so the bulk of our snow has come in just two days. And if you look at it, we're sitting here at about eight inches above our average. If you had just experienced uh, the last three months and you tried to take a guess at how much snow there was, my guess would be guessing somewhere between 50 and 100 inches. Uh, but we're sitting here at 35 which were about a whole month ahead of average. Um, so the snow totals have not been very impressive on the front range. 
but the uh, the way we've gotten it has been. Now, the Eastern Plains, a little different there because they are more significantly above their averages as far as snow totals. And the mountains have also been interesting. Um, we have, if you look at statewide snowpack, I think you'd be a little underwhelmed by the number. I think it's something like 26% above average statewide. <clears throat> and that's just because it's so um, displaced. So the east eastern slopes of the mountains, so the, the, the snow that drains into the South Platte, the Arkansas, and the Rio Grande are, have not seen a very significant amount of snow. Uh, in fact, lower than average in some spots but then the western mountains have have so much snow that it has overcome that the deficit created by the eastern slope so i think you'd be a little surprised to see that we're only 26 percent above average for snowpack and one other note there that you should kind of um you know we always try to ground ourselves when we get excited about good weather um, but last year is the exact same pattern. We had an epic snow pattern in the mountains starting about the day after Christmas, lasting almost through the entire month of January. Uh, at this day last year, our, our snowpack for the mountains was pretty significantly above average statewide. Um, and this is about the time where we hit a uh, dry spell that lasted uh, more than two months. And we ended up with uh, snowpack significantly below average for the season. So I try to stay grounded, but when you're, you're normally this is about the halfway point in the snow accumulation season. Um, you're you're above average. the The chances to finish at or above average for the entire season is so much higher. Certainly good news and. Thanks for grounding us a little bit. So we're about halfway home and we're off to certainly a good start. What's behind it? Why has it been so snowy and cold? Yeah, I mean, for one, one of the reasons is that positive feedback loop that I've talked about. Now, to get there in the first place, you've had to have an unusual event. And we we had two unusual events kick things off in December before Christmas. We had the, the, the uh, early blizzard on the Eastern Plains that was the first sign that we were getting into a little unusual pattern. The Eastern Plains usually don't get something like that until March. And here we are, you know, two weeks before Christmas, we get slammed with a blizzard. And then that big uh, polar vortex uh, intrusion of, of Arctic air that came in just before Christmas, that really set the tone. And um, it was unusual how we got that first big snow in Denver after Christmas because it wasn't a traditional upslope. We had, had to rely on a little bit of luck uh, to get a big banding event to get high snow totals. But since that snow uh, was already set in, in cold uh, prior, and then that was a very wet snow, if you remember. So we're talking about very dense snowpack that did not melt did not recover and sat there. And that's when, who knows what the pattern would have been like after that, but having that snowpack covering the Eastern Plains of Colorado, you know, and even beyond, uh, are, are really the bulk of North America covered with a thick layer of snow set off uh, what uh, is kind of, I refer to as positive feedback loop where that cold sitting there reinforce the cold by having cold air above it in that uh, in that huge area then reflecting all the sunlight uh, from you know that we that we were able to get and then a big area of cold like that actually is big enough to affect weather patterns itself if you look at the uh, the way the the polar jet stream is is kind of what guides the uh, storm pattern in our part of the world and in, in the winter. And if you have this established colder than normal air below south of the jet, and then you have warmer than normal air north of the jet, and where we just uh, saw that the uh, Arctic 
sea ice extent was something like the second lowest uh, in history. And so we've, we've already established that the, the Arctic is warming, you know, when we're talking about the climate change and global warming, where the Arctic is actually an accelerated pace compared to what we're feeling in the mid latitudes. It's happening two and a half to all, nearly three times faster. So we have uh, warmer than normal air above the jet, uh, colder than normal this year um, below the jet. That, that slows down the polar vortex and allows the polar jet stream to be very wavy. And so we've been, we've had a very active pattern and it could be um, set off by what was kind of pre-established. Now, if we get, just to further that just a little bit, if you get uh, a situation where November and early December are very warm in the, in the uh, mid latitudes, then no matter how warm the, the Arctic is, you still have a, a, a variation in temperature enough to keep that polar jet stream tightly wound and uh, not able to create as much waves in the, in the, in the jet stream. So I think that is kind of where we've ended up with right now. And you could throw in, Chris, just a little bit more on how the La Nina signal in in the uh, equatorial Pacific is still colder than average, but um, you do have to see this little bit of decoupling in the atmosphere. And part of part of La Nina El Nino cycle uh, cycle has to do with not only just having the sea surface temperatures vary, but also they have to couple with the atmosphere and. Um, I was reading on the climate.gov's uh, blog, who, who was awesome about following the ENSO, uh, that there has been a little bit of decoupling with the atmosphere, regardless of what we're seeing, uh, sea surface temperatures. So with all that in mind, so it seems like a combination of things, the polar jet being wavier than usual, the decoupling, uh, the ENSO cycle, what you were mentioning with La Nina and that feedback loop. Do we have an idea of what that might mean for the upcoming spring? <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm going to grab. <laughs> I'm going to grab my farmer's almanac to see what they say. No, just, uh, <laughs> still, no uh, really isn't. Uh, obviously, we have a pattern going into February that does not look to be any different. Um, at least, you know, the first ten days of February, where we don't get directly lined up with perfect up upslope storms but we have these kind of clippers going to the northeast of us and with um you know uh, with these southern lows um in between and we're just kind of we're just kind of tweener here in Colorado where we don't catch a break as far as a, a calm warm day and and as far as we don't really get lined up from many storms either so what you end up with is a cold uh and pattern with frequent light snow chances con continuing in and um it it doesn't really seem to break and it may not break until you know we tilt back closer to the sun uh which happens it, around march 1st and i was just looking this up for a report that i'm working on today to to try to um you know we're talking about the bulk of denver snow season still kind of lying ahead because february march and april are statistically our three biggest snowfall months if you average out the last 30 years um but also you know denver averages 13 60 degree days in march and our average first 70 degree day is the first week of March. So that that will break any pattern, but I would not be surprised to see this last uh, another 30 days, 30, 40 days. There you have it. So we're going to stay in the cold and stay in the snow, which means that's good news for you and I, Corey. That's good for business, isn't it? <laughs> that is good for business. We, we love it. And uh, you know, being a storm chaser, I would love to to see this kind of wavy pattern continue into the spring months. Uh, I'm not going to hold my breath, of course, but that 
that would be good for business for for a lot of us. I mean, uh, because we're talking about a wet pattern continuing, but uh, once you get into spring, we're talking a little bit uh, more than just uh, some some light snow. Events. All right. Well, there we have it. Um, meteorologist Corey Repenhage, thanks so much for joining us on News Plus today. We appreciate it. No problem, brother. Always happy to do it.